through 17. The Bible says, Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So now we're in the book of Luke, and in the book of Luke, Jesus was thrust into his ministry after he was baptized by John at the River Jordan. And when he was baptized, John saw the Spirit of God descending on Jesus like a dove. Afterwards, immediately the Spirit led him into the wilderness where he was tempted by the fasted for 40 days, tempted by the enemy, three temptations. Um, and then when he came out of the Spirit, obviously he was victorious over the enemy. How was he victorious over the enemy? Just kind of a side note. The Word of God says. The Word of God says. The Word of God says. You cannot... The enemy cannot fight the Word of God. A Spirit-directed Word of God is what we're looking for. So Jesus came out of the wilderness. He went in full of the Holy Spirit, but he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 4, 14 through 15, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding regions, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. By the way, why did news of him go out through all the surrounding regions? It's not because he was a great teacher, which he was. He's the best teacher that ever lived. But because people, because he was in the power of the Spirit, were being healed, delivered, set free. They were coming out of their, I don't know if they had wheelchairs back then. They were coming out of their ox carts. They were coming out from their pallets. They were, their legs were growing. Their eyes were coming back into their head. Uh, they could see straight. I mean, there were so many things that were happening. And so news of him went throughout all the surrounding regions, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And in our text, we find a woman in the synagogue where Jesus is teaching. Now, the woman is in the synagogue, right? So what is a synagogue? It's, let, me, let me start with the point. She was in the synagogue, but my point in this is that the woman was a part of the people of God. She was a child of God. For our intents and purposes, she was a child of God. Luke 13, 10, and 11, and then verse 16, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and couldn't in no way rise herself up. And the reason I say she was a child of God is because Jesus said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, she was part of the people of God. So here she was, uh, a Jewish woman who by virtue of her birth was considered to be part of the people of God. Today, we are still born into the people of God. We're not born by natural means. We're born by the blood of Jesus, right? Because we accept Christ, we give our lives to Christ, the Spirit of God enters into us, and we become new creations in Christ, and we become children of God, and we cry out, Abba, Father. Although today it's not a physical birth that qualifies you to be a part of the people of God. It's a spiritual birth. John 3, 1 through 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from, from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Moshe, surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born of water? It goes and describes that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Being born of water, when we are carried around in our mother's womb, we are in a sack of water. How do you know you're about to be born? Because your water 
bursts, pops, breaks, whatever synonym you choose to use. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And when you're talking about being born again, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, Jesus said, that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. In other words, you can't see it, but you can feel it. You can recognize it. You know it's there, and that's what it is to be born of the Spirit. You, you sense, you have an experience with God. You sense something taking place in your life. When I got saved, I felt like every uh, chain was broken, that I had a weight on my shoulders I didn't even know I had was taken off, and I felt like Scrooge on Christmas Day. I was as light as a feather, dancing around, literally, my wife and uh, and, uh, and a friend of hers came over. She wasn't my wife at the time. She wasn't my girlfriend at the time. She was just an acquaintance, uh, but she was leading me to the Lord, and she came over, and I said to her and to Roger, who was in the car with her, I said, I'm born again. I've been saved, right? How do I know that? It wasn't a theological thing. I had an experience with God, Amen. Ephesians 2, uh, what, uh, so why must we be born of the Spirit to be part of the people of God? Well, that's pretty much what the good news of Jesus Christ is all about. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, you, those who are Christians, he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. So we were walking around, but we were dead to the things of God. We were dead to God himself, who is life in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, who were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he, God, made us alive together with Christ." By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So this woman was part of the people of God. Number two, the woman was in the house of God. Luke 13, 10 through 11. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. What was a synagogue? It was a gathering place. It was a place where the people of God would gather to hear the Psalms, to hear uh, 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 the, the Word of God, to hear the teachings of the Bible. And so we would kind of liken that to a church service, right? So a woman who was part of the people of God was in church. And behold, she had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise her up. So I want you to notice that this woman was sitting in the gathering place for the people of God. She was sitting in a synagogue. Again, to bring it home to us, we would say she was sitting in church. What was taking place in that gathering place for the people of God? They were doing what we do in church today. They may have been worshiping. They worshiped differently. Uh, they were praying. They were teaching the Word of God. So you might picture this woman, if this was today, would be sitting in church listening to someone teach the Word of God. It was something she had been doing all her life. Listen to me because this is important to where we're going. This woman was in church and we know that for at least 18 years of her life, she had been attending church bent over. I saw a woman like this one time when I was uh, in a car dealership. She was actually bent over 90 degrees at the waist, and that's how she walked around. She was bent over at the waist, and she couldn't stand up straight. The Scripture points out that for the last 18 years of her life, this condition that she had, Jesus actually revealed it, she had been bound by a spirit of infirmity. Remember, she was a part of the people of God. She was among the people of God. She was being taught the Word of God. But all of that did not take care of her most pressing problem. She was bound, and she needed to be set free. Now, we're not saying that worship's not important. We're not saying praying's not important. We're not saying that studying the Bible is not important or hearing the Word of God is not important. But you can do all of that and still be bound. 
Well, I don't believe that. This woman was in that condition. They were doing all of that, and she was bound. She wasn't bound outside. She was bound and coming inside, right? Now, one day, Jesus shows up. Brings us to our third point. The woman heard not the word of God. She heard the word of God. He, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. John 1 and 14 says, The word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word of God put flesh on Jesus, and we saw Je they were seeing Jesus, the word of God, walking around. And what was he doing while he was walking around? He was teaching and he was healing. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit and power, went around doing good, healing all those who are oppressed of the devil, for God is with them. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news, right? To, uh, to, uh, and, and the rest of that, you know how that goes. Mark 1, 22 through 25. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, what does that look like? when you're teaching as someone that doesn't have authority. You kind of say, well, Rabbi this says this, Rabbi this says that, and you really, uh, you know, w w this is kind of where we're leaning, all those kind of things, but there's no power for the individual. There's knowledge here, but no power for the person that's sitting in the pew. Now, there was a woman, again, in the synagogue uh, in, in, with an unclean spirit and cried out saying, let us alone. Actually, in this particular passage, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Up to now, the scribes had taught without authority. They did not expect anything to take place in a synagogue other than for knowledge to be imparted. When Jesus preached, it was with authority, and that authority was backed up with power. Do you know the difference between authority and power? Authority means you have been given a legal permission to do something. If you're a policeman, uh, you can dress up like a policeman. You can buy a badge like a policeman. You can buy a car like a policeman. But if you haven't been deputized, by the police department and given authority, you can look just like a policeman, but you have no authority, right? Now, what's the difference between authority and power? Power is the uh, ability to back up your authority. So what does a policeman have that we immediately know that grants him a little bit of power? Uh, he's got a Glock. He's got a Smith & Wesson. He's got, you know, uh, a team of people to back him up, but he has authority and he has power. Jesus preached the word of God not just to give information, but he preached it with authority, and that authority was backed up with power to do what the word of God revealed to be true. Getting back to our text, this woman who was bound was hearing this man, who is the word of God made flesh, preach, but he wasn't just preaching, he was preaching with authority. First of all, it's important that we understand that according to Jesus, who is the Word of God, she was supposed to be free. Right? Oh, brother, oh, sister, you need to learn how to glorify God in your sickness because God gets glory if you learn how to uh, uh, navigate through that, not lose your faith, and not get discouraged, not get depressed. Somehow or another, it gives God glory. I can imagine this woman being told something like that. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, she's supposed to be free, right? Hypocrite, he says. You go and you untie your donkey, right, uh, from the stall and leave it to water when it's thirsty, you know, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound? Think of it for 18 years, be loosed from this bond of infirmity on the Sabbath? Mark 7, 25 through 27. For a woman whose younger daughter had an unclean spirit heard about Jesus, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. 
Now, she wasn't an Israelite. She wasn't part of the people of God. But she heard what Jesus was doing, and she went to Jesus asking that he would intervene in her daughter's behalf. Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Jesus reveals to us in this passage that healing, and included in that is deliverance, is the bread that belongs to the children, the people of God. What are you saying? Jesus said, this woman, who is a part of the child, a part of the people of God, should be free. Why? Because healing is the children's bread, and included in healing is deliverance. That is the privilege of those who know God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So all this time, this woman had been going to church to receive bread, but the bread she was getting was not all that God had promised. It was like going and buying, uh, I don't want to use a, a name, but white bread and bite into it and realize it's all air. Right? How Sandwich bread? And you all ever buy sandwich bread? Right? And you go buy generic sandwich bread, and, man, you pull the bread out, and you take a bite, and there's nothing to it. I just ate 70 calories, and I don't, it's, like, it's like eating air. It's like eating cotton candy. This weekend, we had a chance to go uh, up to the woodlands, and, and uh, we went to some uh, 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 store, uh, like uh, one of these new trendy stores that that do everything organic, and uh, man, uh, I don't usually eat bread, but I saw this, there's a smaller piece of bread, I said, I'm going to buy that thing, now that's bread, that, you eat that, man, it just, it has substance to it, I mean, you can chew on that thing, it's not like air, well, this woman had to be going to the synagogue and getting a lot of hot air, doesn't mean she wasn't getting anything, but she wasn't getting the true bread that contained what she needed to be set free. It was deficient in nutrients. The true bread of God would have set her free, and as we're about to see, it did indeed set her free whenever the true bread of God showed up in that synagogue. The woman, fourth point, was freed by the power of God, Luke 13, 12 through 13. But when Jesus saw her, he called, to her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And what happened when she was made straight? She glorified God. I, it reminds me, you know, people wonder, is this God? Is that God? And they get hung up on all the minutia. And there is minutia. There, 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 there's always going to be, uh, uh, it's like Peter, whenever Jesus was washing his feet. He, Peter said, no, wash everything. Peter said, when you've been washed, you only need to wash your feet. Why? Because you're going to pick up dirt every once in a while. There's always going to be, uh, uh, we, we like everything to be black and white, but the reality is we live in a real world where there's not all black and white. You've got to navigate. You've got to find out how to do things. You've got to, uh, uh, you know, get through uh, the, the, the situation that you're in. And so, um, you know, th this woman was in the synagogue. I'm trying to figure out how I got here, why I got off on that. I got on a rabbit trail, right. But this rabbit, he got away from me. <laughs> so um, she, she, when Jesus was in the synagogue and he began to preach the word of God, he said to her, be made straight. Oh, here's how I got off on that. So uh, uh, what happens is there's nothing, there's nothing perfectly clean in the sense that you, you always know whenever stuff is happening, you always know what's right and wrong. How do you know God's in something? Is God getting glory? 1995, there was a revival going on uh, in Pensacola. I've told you the story before some of you are new. And here's what I mean. When a revival takes place, lots of stuff happens. There's what some people would say is excess, and other people would say, that's not excess. That's God. I mean, it depends on your perspective. depends on how you're looking at it. If you grew up in church all your life and you see something you've never seen before, you say, that's a, that's a ghost. That's bad. Other people that hadn't been church, they're going, man, isn't God good? And you've got to figure out which one is it. Well, I didn't know. I was hearing reports on one side. I'm hearing reports on the other side. So I go down there, and when I go out, down there, 
people are falling over, people are getting touched by God, you know, people are shaking, all these kind of things that one side said, that ain't God, and other people say it is God, all that stuff was happening. Well, what is it? Is this God or not? And then there was the Friday night baptisms, and whenever they got up on Friday night, and the particular one that I went to, there was a drug addict that testified to being uh, 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 given the gospel of salvation, accepting Christ, and he got set free from his drug addiction. There was a prostitute that was up there getting baptized, talking about how somebody told her about Jesus, and she got delivered from her lifestyle. And what they were doing is they were giving glory to God. How do you know God's in something? Because the devil will not give God glory. You hear what I'm saying? That's a general principle. He's not going to glorify God. Now, this woman was made straight, and immediately, what did she do? She glorified God. When Jesus saw her, the word of God that had the power to change her life was released to her, and she was freed from her bondage, and she was made whole. Now, remember, Jesus said, this is the children's bread. In other words, this should be normal. How often is it become in the church abnormal? We're not saying that we don't, we don't want to see it. We do, but it's not the norm. It's uncommon. Healing and deliverance and freedom should be so common among the church that, that when it happens in even greater extent, that God doesn't just do miracles. He does extraordinary miracles. What does it mean? Miracles are the norm. Right? It's normal for people to get saved. It's normal for people to get healed. It's normal for people to get delivered from whatever affliction or infirmity or something that they have in life. It's the norm. Well, why doesn't it happen? One, because we don't know that it's God's will for your life. We don't know it's God's will for my life. And number two, we don't have the faith. If we do know it's God's will, we don't always have the faith to pursue God's will for our life. Because it takes faith. Now, I, I don't have a, a, a definition for this. I was just thinking about this the other day, and I don't think it's absolutely correct. But I tend to think the working of miracles is when the person that is being used is working in a situation where people don't have faith. I'm not saying that's all that it is but that's a working of miracles. I tend to think that healing takes place when people have uh, lend their faith, mingle their faith with the Word of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God can do both. God can do miracles, and God can do healings. And He gave, in the, in the, in the gifts of the Spirit, He gave workings of miracles. He gave gifts of healings. Why are there gifts of healings? Because some people tend to have uh, uh, strengths in certain areas of healing, and other people have the strength in other areas of healings. We don't all carry the whole package. What I'm saying is all available, but I believe that God's desire is that as a people, we don't remain ignorant with the Word of God, but we become knowledgeable of the Word of God. And as we become knowledgeable of the Word of God, it's not just sitting in the synagogue listening or sitting in church listening and say, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, I know where that scripture is. Yeah, but it's actually the Word of God gets in you, and there's something about the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith begins to grow. Your faith begins to activate, and then all of a sudden that Word of God has power in it. Because when Gabriel came to Mary, he says to her, you're going to, have a child. She says, how is this going to be? I'm not married. I'm, he said, the, the Spirit of the Lord will overshadow you. And he says, nothing is impossible with God. But actually, that's not what he really said. What he said was, not without power from God, every word from God. That means every word from God contains within it the power to bring itself to completion. Well, how does that word of God that's contained in a seed release to, 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 of its power when it's mingled with faith? Well, I liked it until there. Now you're putting some responsibility on me. Yes, 
Yes, but it's not, you don't have to have a lot of faith. You just have to have a little bit of faith. The, the, the father who had the child, I'm going off a little bit, so you can't find it up there, don't worry, I'm, I'm on a rabbit trail, a uh, big rabbit trail, big rabbits. The father who had a child that was demonized, right? He said, I brought, Jesus comes down from the mountain, I brought him to your disciples, your, your disciples couldn't do anything, can you help? Jesus said, all things are possible if you will just believe. And I, he didn't have a lot of faith, but he had enough faith to find Jesus, right? And then he said, he said, I believe, help my unbelief. It's not like he didn't say, man, I got a lot of faith. He said, I don't have a lot of faith, but if it'll work, I believe, help me with my own. That's all Jesus needs, Right? How many times do we come to church, we hear the Word of God, and I'm just telling I've been a pastor for a long time. I've pastored you for a long time. Turn to somebody and say, yes, he is talking to you. I've been reading Charles Finney. You may want to let me not read Charles Finney anymore because I've been picking up a little bit of Charles Finney's directness, right? How often have I sat in this service knowing not just not just by what I know, but also knowing by what the Spirit of God lets me know that you have something and God is more than willing to do something in your life, but you don't respond. Again, I turned to somebody and said, yeah, he's still talking to you. Why? Because we let the enemy rob us of God's goodness. Because we sometimes expect things to happen. If God wants to do it, he knows where I'm at. He could, but there's no faith on your part. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not saying you don't have faith. I'm saying you don't have faith for that in your life if you just sit back and say, Jesus knows where I'm at. When Jesus was passing this way, there was two blind men. We'll just we'll stick with uh, uh, those two blind. We'll go with the two blind men. There was two blind men sitting on the side of the road, and they were calling out to Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And what happened? Jesus kept white on rocking. Right? So you know what these men did? He wasn't my time. Oh, he doesn't care about us. You know, maybe it's the will of God that we just have this sickness. But that's not what they did. you got to remember, they are blind. You know what they did? They followed Jesus. In their blindness, they followed Jesus. Well, doesn't Jesus know he's following? I'm sure he did. But they're not going to take no for an answer. They're going to continue to follow Jesus until they get his attention. The Bible says when he came into the house... We don't know where they started. They could have been several miles outside of the city. But they didn't let that stop him. They didn't let the crowd stop him. They didn't let the people. They kept crying out the whole way they followed him. They kept saying, Jesus, someday have mercy. And when he got into the house, then he turned around. When he turned around, he said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, we want to see. Let it be done according to your faith. How did they demonstrate their faith? by following Jesus until he turned around. You hear what I'm saying? They didn't take no for an answer. Jesus is going to heal me. His word teaches me that. By his stripes I am healed. He forgives all my iniquity. He heals all my diseases. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. To the one who fears his name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and I will go forth like a calf leaping from its stalls. Right? He is my healer. I'm going to be healed. You're going to be healed. But we got to have the faith to see it through. The enemy's going to be right there saying, he don't want to heal you. He don't love you. He's not going to touch your life. And so you know what a lot of times we do? We just sit back and say, I don't want to be disappointed, so I'm not going to put myself in a position where I can be disappointed. Huh? Oh, yeah. Another, yeah, that's another lie of the enemy. There's somebody that needs it more than I do. There's somebody worse off than I am. As if Jesus only has a certain amount of power. Right? 
And what ends up happening? You carry the same thing. You go away carrying the same thing. And like this woman for 18 years, she was bent over when if Jesus had been there and if she would have just been there when he was there 18 years ago, she could have been free the whole time. So, fourth, the woman was freed by the power of God. Luke 13, 12 through 13. When Jesus saw her, he called to him and said to her, uh, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. When Jesus saw her, the word of God that had the power to change her life was released into her and she was freed from her bondage and made whole. Paul tells us that the gospel is not just powerful, but it is in fact the power of God. The good news of Jesus Christ is power. It is power. Well, it's power to save. We know that. Why? People get saved all the time. You know why people get saved all the time? Because we have faith to believe that people will get saved. Did you know that centuries ago, people thought you had to pray for, a, uh, you know, uh, three weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, months, years until God saved you? That's what they believed. And you know what happened? They had to wait two weeks, three weeks, eight weeks, 16 weeks, three, mo three years, six years, until they got to a place where they felt like they were saved. Then all of a sudden, we began to recognize, no, by, the, the, uh, you know, uh, by grace are you saved by faith. We began to understand, we got a better understanding that faith is believing God's word, and all I got to do is know who I am, know who Christ is, abide by his word, put my faith in his word, and if I call on the name of the Lord, the word of God says I'll be saved. We have altar calls today. People come, they hear the word of God, and they come to the front, and they call on the name of the Lord, and they don't have to wait two months, three months. They get saved. Not only is the, per you know why they are getting saved? Because we believe they're going to get saved. They believe they're going to get saved, and we believe they're going to get saved. If we didn't believe they were going to get saved, we wouldn't offer that to them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We have learned over the process of centuries that you don't have to wait years to get saved, right? Our faith, because of our knowledge in the Word of God and the revelation that God has given us towards salvation, has got to a place where we just know all you got to do is say this prayer, believe it in your heart, and you shall be saved, right? But when it comes to healing, well, sometimes God heals. Sometimes he doesn't heal, you know. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's just, it, we, we have all these reasons why. So, you know, what's really happening. And I'm not talking about the person that's sitting in the pew with the infirmity. I'm talking about the church in general. We don't have the same faith for healing that we do for salvation. But it's exactly the same. It's the word of God, the promise of God, the people of God who believe in the word of God and what begins to happen when we put our faith in the word of God, what God says in this word begins to take place. It reminds me, I preached a sermon on it before. I think it's Acts chapter 5. Do you, you guys mind if I go hunting for rabbits? Okay, I think it's in Acts chapter 5. It says in verse 12, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest there joined them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers, so it's not just people that were joining the church, it says, and believers. Now, we tend to think a believer is someone who goes to church. No, I don't think that's what the context means here. People that believe, right? These signs shall follow those that believe. Believe in what? That these signs shall follow. These were believers. It says, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they, who's they? The believers. Because of what God was doing through the apostles, the believers brought the sick out into the streets, laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. So where was what were they, what were they uh, uh, um, expressing? They were expressing faith. God's healing. 
Look at what God is doing. You need to come with me. You know, we need to get you out on the street when Peter comes by. Why? Because when Peter comes by, whenever John comes by, when the Spirit of the Lord is moving through them, you're going to get healed. And so it wasn't the people themselves, the lame. It was the believers that were going and telling the lame and bringing them. And I want you to know, it's not easy to carry a lame person. But their faith was... And what happened when they did that? So that they brought the sick out into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least a shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them, and also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people, bringing those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And this is my favorite part of this. And they were all healed. Not some, not a few. They were all healed. Why were they all healed? Because there was a, an incredible dynamic of expectancy and faith and trust that this is what God was going to do. You're hearing what I'm saying? We need to get to a place. Now, I'm talking about the people that come in here sick and all that kind of, but we as a church need to get to a place where we understand healing is the children's bread. It is just as much God's will to heal as it is to save. And when we get to that place and we start believing it, not my, no, but we start believing it, watch what God's going to do. He's going to do something tonight. But watch what God does. And you know uh, what begins to happen as people start to get healed and people start to experience it. And we've had some of that. But you say, well, how come I hadn't heard about it? Because same people here don't talk. Love you. But you don't talk about what God's done in your life. You keep it to yourself. Why? Why don't you talk about your healings? How many of y'all been healed in the last, uh, this year? How come I've never heard about it? How are people going to believe for healing if they don't have a testimony of God healing? Are you hearing what I'm saying? How many of y'all been saved in the last year? Anybody here been saved in the last year? Rededicated your life in the last year? I'm not going to call you out. Right? How about in the last two years? Yeah? How come I never hear testimony? Well, I'm scared. Everybody's scared. The devil wants to feed your fear so you don't do anything so that others can hear what God is doing in your life and, get, and, and God be glorified. And it builds faith. You hear what I'm saying? It builds faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes. The word Paul uses for salvation is more than just spiritual salvation. It actually means wholeness or soundness in every area of life. So it is the power of God to free us from any and everything that we need freedom in. 1 Corinthians 2 and 4, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. I remember one time when I was first pastor, I was listening to my sermons. I still listen to my sermons, but not for the same reasons. And I would think to myself, man, I could have said this differently. I need to watch. I need to practice my vocalizations. I need to do all these kind of things. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, don't do that. And he told me why. He said, people, when they hear you, they don't hear you. They hear the Spirit of God speaking through you. Right? Oh, man, i got to get it just right. i got to get every, all my P's and Q's and all those kind of things, or people aren't going to get saved. Paul says it's not with eloquent words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. I think the church today, and I'm talking about uh, us included, if we're not careful, we start to get, uh, 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 we start to major on eloquent words of wisdom. And what we need to major on is demonstration of the Spirit and power. Oh, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We just don't practice them. Why? Too much mess. Well, guess what? 
That's like saying, I believe in children, I just don't want to have any. Why? Too much mess. You ever known a kid that wasn't messy? Did you still have children? Yeah. Why? Because it's the will of God. It's what God wanted us to do, be fruitful and multiply. It's what we want to do. It's a way to express our love. And then God gave us the gifts of the Spirit for that particular reason. Out of love, He empowered us with the gifts of the Spirit. And guess what? We're going to have to learn how to work with them. We're going to have to learn how to use them. We're going to have to learn how to function with them. People are going to make mistakes. Don't be afraid. Don't take it the wrong way. If sometimes, every once in a while, I won't embarrass you in public, but I might come up to you and I'm going to say, mm, you know, you missed it. But it's okay. Keep on trying. Right? Don't be afraid of whatever case may be. You got this one right. You did good. Right? How are we going to grow if we're not willing to accept correction? And how are we going to grow if we're not willing to make mistakes? Anybody here that wants to get good in football, wants to get good in basketball, tennis, track, you got to be willing to be bad at it before you can get good at it. Because nobody's good when they start. You have potential, but you ain't good. you got to work at it to get good. But in order to do that, you've got to be able to receive instruction. But you don't stop because you're not good. You continue to press forward. Thought salvation is more than just spiritual salvation. It actually means wholeness or soundness in every area of life. What I want to bring to our t attention today is that the house of God should be a place where we pray, worship, and teach the Word of God, yes, but we can do all that and still miss it. The church today needs to be not only these things taking place, but there needs to be the authority and the power of God available and resonant to set people free from their infirmities and afflictions. Jesus, when he walked the earth, was the light of God who in power demonstrated the glory of God by setting people free. Matthew 4, 13 through 17. Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Who is that? Jesus. And upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. Who is that? Jesus. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 23 through 4, 24, Jesus, what did he do? How was he the light? He went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. As Jesus was the light of God, so too are we. as his body sent into the world to be the light of God. We, the church, like Jesus, are to be the light of God that points people to Jesus and through our good works brings him glory. Matthew 5, 14 and 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 60, it says, uh, the Spirit, uh, Arise and shine, for your light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, we're the light of the world. The glory of God is on us. Why don't we have to arise and shine? Because you've got to turn on your light. You've got to purposely turn on your light. How do I do that? John 14 and 12, Jesus said, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Who will do these works? Whoever believes in me. Matthew 10, 7 through 8. And as you go, preach. Don't get hung up on that word preach. It could be teach. It could be testify. It could be witness. It could be talk to somebody saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out demons. Freely you've received. Freely give. This woman, when she went to synagogue that day, she not only experienced a good service, what else did she experience? She heard the word of God from the living word and experienced the power of God which set her free. 
May it always be when, whenever people come into the house of God that they will always be in a place where they experience the power of God to save, heal, deliver, and set them free from the power of the enemy. Acts 5, 14 through 16, And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. I already read that, but I'll read it again. So they brought out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, let me just say this. Y'all will bring people to church because you know that if they come to church, they're going to get saved. You do. Now, a lot of people don't come, but it doesn't mean you don't try. I know you try. I know you. I know many of y'all inviting people to church all the time. Why do you do it? Some people come because you know if they come to church, they're going to get saved. Right? Let's get to that place where we invite the sick, the lame, those that are hurting, and say, come to church. Why? Because if you come, you're going to get healed. Well, I can't promise them something that, that may not happen. See, that's the thing. We've got to grow in our faith. We got to begin to believe that it's the will of God, not just to save, but also to heal. I feel like there's a prophetic word for Tom.